Okay, so um, this uh, presentation today, uh, I want to welcome you and um, give a little bit of overview about um, general issues dealing with uh, quantitative dissertations, uh, specifically how to approach uh, hypothesis development, thesis development, and then um, strategies for uh, the variable types that emerge from um, those kinds of decisions. So uh, just a brief outline here of what I'm going to talk about. Um, first of all, as I briefly alluded to just now, um, the uh, development of a thesis and subsequent hypothesis. Um, those are very closely related concepts. Um, and then uh, some of the established uh, ways in the social scientific community that uh, are used to evaluate hypotheses, to support or refute them. Um, and then that leads us into a discussion of the types of variables that you can use uh, in your dissertation study. Uh, and there's a few different types, and uh, in uh, a second um, way of looking at uh, using variables in a dissertation study is the number of variables that you're going to be using. Typically, you have predictor or independent variables on one hand, and outcome or uh, dependent variables on the other, and you can have one or multiple of each of those. So not only the type of variable, but also the number of variables is going to be covered. And then finally, um, some broad strokes about how to analyze data, um, and some issues that, uh, that I've seen as a methodology expert here at the Chicago School and elsewhere in terms of uh, best practices and also emerging practices. Okay, so uh, to begin with, um, a thesis, and this is just, you know, a dictionary definition here, is a position or proposition that a person advances and offers to maintain by argument. So this is um, sort of by definition a general and conceptual kind of uh, position that you're going to take, and it is based on a literature review. Um, typically what happens is you will start by looking at the existing scientific literature and identifying gaps or theoretical problems with what's already out there, and then you, um, from there, develop your own idea about what needs to be the next step. And then um, the, the piece about maintaining it by argument has to do with the logic of how you're going to um, uh, evaluate your thesis. And so what happens is you do that by uh, positing a, a hypothesis. Notice that it also has the word thesis in there as the root, but the hypo means it's you know, underneath a thesis. And the reason it's underneath is because it's more specific. It's a tentative assumption that you make in order to draw out and test its logical or empirical consequences. And um, for a doctoral dissertation, what that basically means is you're going to be uh, conducting an empirical research study. Right? You're going to go out and collect data and then evaluate what the, uh, what the facts are compared to what your predictions were. And so, um, again, it's specific and it's testable. That's key. It has to be testable. Um, and it also has to use operational definitions for constructs. What this means is that as opposed to a thesis, which is more general, and you kind of you know, talk about ideas and, and, and concepts, here you're providing actual criteria by which you're going to um, evaluate those constructs. So for example, down here at the bottom, you see I have a, a little sort of generic hypothesis. Personality as measured by X, some, some measure of personality, is positively correlated with, with well-meaning, uh, I'm sorry, with well-being, as measured by some other uh, uh, questionnaire or, or survey or behavior. So it's very specific. And so um, to give you a little overview of these initial steps of, uh, of developing a hypothesis, you start with the literature review, right? And then you identify those gaps or those theoretical shortcomings of what's already used to explain patterns out in the world. And um, you kind of go back and forth. You see there's this kind of feedback loop set up. Because the more you learn about a topic, um, the more you have to explore what's already understood about it. Um, and if you find a gap, well, you have to go back into the literature. Maybe there's something that you um, read that might have something that you have to revisit because now you have a different concept of, of what to look for. Or maybe there's other literature that you haven't yet uh, explored that may identify um, some uh, answers to questions that you uh, develop as you initially review literature. So from there you develop a thesis, right? Once you settle on a good set of literature, you see what the field is doing, you see where everything is, then you can settle on a thesis and a subsequent hypothesis 
which then dictates the design. And this is where we're going to be focusing today, is the stage of developing a hypothesis and designing a study around it. Once you get to that point, um, you have to make a decision uh, because you have different methods at your disposal and um, you can either go the qualitative route or the quantitative route. Um, and once you determine your thesis, this is where you kind of have to make that decision and everything subsequent to that uh, is really more of just a straight shot. Um, so with a quantitative study, you're really looking for a broad understanding based on large samples. Um, and it's, it's confirmatory, meaning that you, you develop this kind of thesis and a hypothesis that you then want to confirm or disconfirm uh, using um, you know, data that you, you gather from the world. Um, and it will tell you, those data will tell you whether or not um, your idea is supported. Um, with a qualitative study, it's more exploratory. So um, if you determine that the, the state of knowledge is rather um, uh, vague or a, a topic has not been explored in any um, depth, then you want to go into uh, a qualitative approach, which will be uh, something that Dr. Adu, another uh, methodology expert here at NCADE, will be covering tomorrow. And, and um, I'll show you the link at the end of the presentation to that. But for our purposes today, we're going to be looking at the quantitative um, side of uh, social science research. So what happens once you have your hypothesis and design, like I said, it's kind of a straight shot. At that point, you've already settled on your uh, strategy. You, you, know, you, you sample your participants, you collect data, you analyze the data, and then you report it in uh, your dissertation, right? So hopefully, uh, by the time that you get to your hypothesis stage, um, you've already figured out what you're going to be doing um, because you can't really go back uh, once you have your data, that's it, right? Unless you want to spend 10 years in grad school, um, you want to do it right the first time, right? Um, okay, so what's all this talk about hypothesis, right? How do we actually uh, evaluate a hypothesis? What's the logic behind it? The starting point with any hypothesis is the null hypothesis. It's often denoted as H sub zero, null being, you know, synonymous with zero, right? Um, and the reason that it's the starting point is that because we always assume that there's no effect. There are, whatever you're hypothesizing, you have to sort of overcome that initial assumption that there is no effect and you have to uh, obtain data that you know, rejects that assumption. And the way that you reject it is uh, by supporting the alternative to a null uh, finding, which is a significant finding, right? Um, and this is often uh, denoted as H sub 1 or H sub A uh, for alternative. And 1 obviously being different from 0. Uh, and essentially what happens is that if you support your alternative hypothesis, then you by definition reject the null hypothesis. So these are mutually exclusive outcomes, right? If you find support for your alternative hypothesis, um, it means that uh, you know, you've um, basically found a pattern out in the world that would be highly unlikely if the null hypothesis were true. And um, there are a couple of different ways that you can uh, phrase a hypothesis, open-ended versus directional. And um, an open-ended hypothesis is also called a two-tailed hypothesis. You might have seen this uh, when reading um, some literature previously, where the null hypothesis is still that there's no effect out in the world. But the alternative hypothesis is that there is a significant association between factor A and factor B. Um, note that it doesn't say what the direction of the effect is. It doesn't say that you know, factor A is positively related with factor B or negatively related with factor B. Just that you know, there is some connection there that you want to uh, confirm. The alternative is that um, you have a directional, also called a one-tailed hypothesis. The null hypothesis is still the same. There's no connection. But the alternative hypothesis is where the difference comes into play, where you actually make a prediction of what the direction of the effect is. So you might predict, okay, group A is significantly higher than group B on, you know, uh, some measure. Um, or group A is significantly lower, or factor A is positively associated with factor B, or negatively associated with factor B, depending on what the specifics of your question are. But the, the, the takeaway message is that um, you actually state, you make a prediction on what the nature of the relationship really is. And you basically make the decision on whether to do an open-ended or directional hypothesis based on your ability to predict 
the outcomes, right? So again, you look at the literature review, you get an idea of what you think is going to happen, and uh, and those identified gaps that I mentioned um, earlier. And of course, uh, if there's enough previous research, then you can do an open-ended hypothesis. If there's a lot of previous research, that will give you more clues as to whether or not you can posit a directional hypothesis. So, okay, that's the two sort of basic kinds of, uh, of ways that you could phrase a hypothesis. Um, then there's the question of what constitutes support for an alternative hypothesis, right? How can you decide whether or not you can reject that, uh, that initial assumption that there is no effect? How can you support an alternative hypothesis? One traditional way that's well established is significance testing, right? We've all probably seen some form of a p-value before, that magical value of p is less than 0.05 or less than 0.001, depending on how stringent uh, you want to be. So um, the, the, in brief, the, the nature of significance testing is that if in reality there is no effect, right, if the null hypothesis is true, what is the probability of obtaining an effect that you obtain? This, this comes into play when you um, actually have your data and you look and say, okay, uh, the, the difference between my groups is so large that if there is no effect, then this is a really freakish occurrence. And um, if it's freakish enough, then we agree that uh, the effect is real and we reject the notion that there is no effect. And typically that uh, agreed upon criterion is a probability of five times out of 100 having such a freakish event occur. Um, the null hypothesis is untenable. Sometimes it has to be one out of a thousand. And um, that's, that's sort of the logic of uh, significance testing. Um, another uh, increasingly um, required uh, definition of support is effect size. So um, you may be familiar with Pearson's R. This is a correlation coefficient if you're looking at two continuous variables. Um, Cohen's D which is a measure of uh, the, the distance between two uh, distributions, or eta squared, which is a measure of the variance accounted for uh, in one variable by uh, variation in another variable. And um, what happens is that sometimes you might find a significant effect. You might have a p-value of 0.1, which is you know, more than 0.05, right? But you still might have a relatively large effect which is still important, even if it doesn't reach significance. And so what we're seeing more and more of over the last 10, 20 years is that um, uh, the, the scientific community is requiring uh, effect sizes to be reported. So it's important to keep this in mind in addition to just uh, a point estimate of, uh, of significance. And um, something that's also emerging more recently is this notion of reporting confidence intervals. And what confidence intervals tell you is um, it's, it's related to the p-value, but what it tells you is if you were to run your study 100 times, 95 of those 100 times, what could you expect uh, to find? Um, 95 times out of 100, what would be the expected difference between two groups that uh, you're studying? What would be the expected correlation coefficient that you could expect to find? And uh, even more importantly, what could you expect that p-value to be if you were to run the study 100 times? Um, and so this is the difference between a significance test, an effect size, and a confidence interval, is that a confidence interval gives you what's called an interval estimate, whereas the, the first two items here give you point estimates, which is sort of a snapshot based on your study. And a confidence interval allows you to sort of extrapolate from your data what would happen 95 times out of 100. So um, I want to give you a, a bit of more in-depth information on this. Uh, here we have an example where uh, there's 10 hypothetical studies. Um, you can see the link down there at the bottom, maybe, um, which is where uh, you can read more about this kind of uh, analysis. But uh, to briefly summarize, what we have here is uh, 10 studies that were run on the same exact uh, uh, design. So the difference between two groups on a measure of, let's just say, um, self-esteem. And you have one group which got an experimental uh, therapy to improve self-esteem and another group that got a more traditional uh, therapy that also aims to improve self-esteem. And what you see on the, uh, on the x-axis here is the, is the difference between the groups. So a difference of zero, right, this dotted line, means that the, the experimental treatment has no uh, added benefit in terms of improving self-esteem, right? And so what you have in these 10 different studies is obviously a different uh, mean difference. So for example, you see that this, uh, 
This study down here shows a, a difference of one. This study here shows a difference of six. So, okay, so there's some variability, right? And you have all these different point estimates where um, you see what the actual study found, right? It compared the two groups and found that there's a certain difference between them. Um, so those are your point estimates. What you also have, though, are these interval estimates. Again, meaning what is the, what, what could we expect to observe given those same data? What could we expect to observe as the range of possible differences between those two conditions? And you see that some of these 95% um, uh, confidence intervals cross zero, right? So that means, okay, even if your study found a difference between the groups of about, you know, two points, whatever that might mean, or or two and a half or one. It also shows that at least part of the time, the difference could be zero or could even be going in the other direction. So it provides you this more robust ability to, um, to analyze uh, your, your findings. Now, of course, we could apply this to p-values as well, like I mentioned, right? So here I've sort of uh, changed this. This isn't to scale, and it's not the mean difference anymore. This could be the p-value. So you could have uh, a 95% confidence interval around the p-value that you observed. So even if your p-value is greater than 0.05, you can see that in some of these examples, um, you could have a p-value that was in fact significant. So uh, it, it, it shouldn't be underestimated that if you were to rerun the study 100 times, if 30% of the time you would get a significant effect, that might still be worth something. And it would certainly be informative in terms of uh, helping the scientific community understand what's going on. Because if enough dissertations are put together and you can build this kind of picture of what happens after 10 studies, then we have a better idea of what's going on with, in this case, you know, uh, interventions for self-esteem, right? Now, of course, in your study, you're only contributing one piece of information. But at the same time, uh, you're providing a more robust picture than just that one point estimate of a p-value or the mean difference. You're, you're, you can uh, communicate with your audience that uh, here are the potential outcomes that we could expect uh, with 95% certainty. So uh, this is, again, an emerging technique, and I encourage you to, uh, to look into it. Again, there's that link down there at the bottom of the screen, and this uh, presentation will also be available um, it's being recorded, so you'll be able to uh, revisit this in more detail later. Um, right now, I want to take a quick pause and uh, see if there are any questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute everyone for a second, and let's see uh, if uh, we're all, um, you know, oh, I have to unmute, if, oh, if there are any questions. Are you guys, okay. Is the baby the other side? Okay, I'll, I'll go back. <laughs> So, uh, but so many of those advances used to happen. I think I think there might be a question, but it's it's kind of quiet. I can't really hear. Yes, we have wording and not wording. Oh, oh, and the live part. Okay, well, if uh, if there are any questions, I think it might be better if we just uh, type them into the chat window. Um, so I'm gonna. Um, mute everyone again and then um, move forward. Okay, so um, wait, give me one second. Okay, so uh, moving on from um, from hypothesis testing uh, procedures, let's look at terminology. Um, I've worked with a lot of students who um, run across you know, different terminologies in different studies, and uh, these different terms mean the same things, or very similar things. So I just want to kind of review the terminology that's used, and this, of course, is going to tie into the way that you phrase a hypothesis, that you conduct a study, um, and it has implications for uh, the types of variables that um, you're going to be using. So first of all, uh, independent variable. Um, you may have heard this term before. It's used in experiments and quasi-experiments. Um, the difference is that an experiment, you actually manipulate a variable, so the type of treatment, right? Um, you can randomly assign people into an experimental treatment, a traditional treatment, a control group, what have you, um, and you know conduct a uh, conduct uh, an analysis of any differences on the basis of that manipulation. In a quasi experiment, you aren't manipulating anything. You're, you're comparing different groups that already exist out in the world. So for example, uh, the sex of your participants 
is not something you can randomly assign, right? You have males out in the world, you have females out in the world. And um, if you're interested in sex differences on some variable, you would be conducting what's called a quasi-experiment, and still uh, it would be an independent variable in, uh, in, in the sort of vocabulary that you'd want to be using. Now, an independent variable has two or more what are called levels. Um, so you can have one independent variable with two levels, one independent variable with three levels, however many levels are appropriate to your study. Um, in our examples from this slide, the experiment has a, uh, you know, a standard treatment, that's one level, or an experimental treatment, that's a second level. Um, in, a, in the quasi-experimental example, one level would be males, another level would be females. Um, and also, uh, what's important to note is that the independent variable is sort of intertwined with a dependent variable. So uh, you have um, these different groups that you're creating, right, these different levels, and then you're looking for differences between those levels on some dependent variable. So this is where hypothesis really comes into play, right? How far apart are the two groups? Is the treatment more successful than the other treatment? Um, is one sex different than another sex on, uh, on some dependent variable? And again, this could be you know, depression scores, it could be um, uh, well-being, it could be self-esteem, it could be anything that you're interested in studying. Okay, so right, so for example, um, the number of anxiety attacks in PTSD patients, the dependent variable, depends on treatment type administered to the patient. That's a hypothesis, right? The number of anxiety attacks in PTSD patients depends on the sex of the patient. That's a hypothesis. So here you see that there's, um, there's a sort of dependent relationship between uh, the independent variable and then some dependent variable. And this is, this is a, a vocabulary that you're going to have to try to use consistently as you go through um, writing your dissertation and formulating hypotheses and everything like that. There are also uh, predictors and outcomes. You can map these onto independent and dependent variables respectively. Um, a predictor is consistent with an independent variable, except when you're uh, running a correlational or observational study where you're not manipulating anything. Um, you're just observing you know, natural patterns out in the world, um, you would call uh, whatever variable you're um, treating as a predictor just that, a predictor variable. So again, observable phenomena that occur out in the world. So um, if you're looking at you know, strength of attachment, for example, something that ranges from 0 to 10, um, that could be something you observe, and you could use that as a predictor um, for uh, some other variable. You could also use something like duration of incarceration as a predictor of you know, something uh, maybe like recidivism. Um, and then, of course, uh, the predictor is intertwined with an outcome or criterion variable. And uh, these are now synonymous with dependent variable, except, again, in correlational research, you would um, call them outcome or criterion variables. So, uh, you know, again, a couple of examples. Um, the strength of attachment predicts self-esteem, right? The duration of incarceration predicts time until recidivism because it's a predictor, right? And um, there are variations on this nomenclature. Uh, you see that I've highlighted in bold here the top two rows where we have independent variable, dependent variable, predictor variable, outcome variable. Um, you also have them called antecedent variables and consequence variables, treatment variables and criterion variables, stimulus variables and response variables, and causes and effects, um, depending on what branch of psychology or social science um, or method you're looking at. And there's also, at the bottom, you'll see that I highlighted uh, bivariate relationship, and, and, and there's no distinction between, um, you know, predictor and outcome. Uh, a lot of the time, what you see is just a correlation, where you're not making any sort of inference about which variable is a predictor, which one is an outcome. You just want to describe a relationship between two variables, or establish that it even exists before moving on to more sophisticated questions of, you know, which one causes the other. Um, and typically in a dissertation, that will be a good starting point. But then you, you probably want to collect data that will allow you to uh, research that relationship in more depth and try to establish what the real patterns are and what the approach for treatment would um, obviously be. So um, there is a bit of theory that goes along with what I just said. Um, if we're looking at experimental or quasi-experimental studies, uh, you can demonstrate causality by a couple of different uh, criteria. Um, and it basically boils down to uh, sufficient and necessary conditions. Um, 
what that means, and you have to have both. That's why it has and in you know big bold letters. Um, what this means is, I'll just use an example. A sufficient condition is that in the presence of some experimental treatment, um, let's just say that you know it's uh, uh, anxiety that you're studying, that in the presence of that treatment, anxiety decreases after the treatment, right? Um, but the second side of the story is the necessary condition, is that without the experimental treatment, anxiety should not decrease. If, you know, somebody doesn't go through the treatment and anxiety also happens to decrease, well then you haven't shown anything about the effectiveness of that experimental treatment. Um, so basically, right, if, if, uh, if anxiety is low no matter what, then you know you can't say that the uh, the experimental treatment had some kind of effect, um, and it's of course important to have both of these pieces in place before you can start to make any kind of causal claims about its effectiveness. Now, with predictors and outcomes, uh, we always have to keep in mind that correlation does not imply causation. That would be a logical fallacy. Um, so you know, just because two things go together doesn't mean that one causes the other. Um, for example. Um, uh, my wife got me sick. I don't know if you can tell a little stuffed up, but uh, she got me sick, and um, she says to me, oh, you know, I think that um, my coworker got me sick because she was sick the other day. And I said, okay, well, that makes intuitive sense, sure. Um, but then again, uh, she also rides the subway. Um, she also, you know, works in an office uh, full of people, right? So um, there could have been something else that actually caused her to get sick. Um, now, in turn, it's tempting for me to blame her on getting me sick because, you know, I, uh, I, I come in close contact with her all the time, right? But maybe I also got sick on the subway. So it's very tempting to infer that if you find a relationship between two things happening in time, that, you know, one caused the other. But we always have to think, what else could it be? So um, you can make some causal claims based on correlational models, but you have to sort of uh, tick all of these boxes here. Um, the predictor variable, what you think is the predictor variable, has to precede um, that what you're calling the outcome variable in time. So yes, um, somebody, if you think somebody who sneezed on you caused you to get sick, then they would have had to have sneezed on you before you got sick, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Secondly, um, there has to be a correlation between the predictor and the outcome variable, meaning that um, when you're collecting data, uh, there has to be some consistent link. The more of one, the more of the other. Or the less of one, the more of the other. Whether it's a positive or negative correlation, there has to be some kind of, um, you know, co-occurrence of them. And the third piece, this is the most important part, right, uh, that the sources of spurious correlation have been controlled, meaning that you've eliminated the possibility of other variables uh, causing both of the observed phenomena that you're interested in. If you don't have this last part, you really can't make too many uh, causal claims. And um, the second overall piece of this puzzle is that a correlational study needs a zero point. This is similar to um, the necessary condition in uh, experimental studies. And basically it's saying if you have um, uh, the absence of your predictor, you should see uh, you know, an opposite effect on the outcome than when the predictor is present. If it's the same no matter what the uh, uh, predictor is doing, if the outcome is the same no matter what the uh, value of the predictor, then, you know, there's no, uh, there's no correlation and everything else falls apart. Okay, so what can you use as a zero point? Um, Pre-treatment data, for example. If you see that pre-treatment, um, there was, you know, uh, overall high anxiety or overall low self-esteem, and then after, uh, you know, uh, with, with folks who have gone through treatment um, over time, there are uh, improvements, then you've shown that initially there was that sort of zero point from which things changed. Um, you can also use comparison groups that um, don't have uh, uh, the same type of um, uh, predictor variable in place. So folks who didn't get sneezed on, right? Um, and also you can look at published evidence that demonstrates that in very similar situations, 
there, uh, there could be an absence of some predictor and in turn an absence of some outcome. And you can use that to sort of build a case for, um, for causality. Okay, so here I want to pause again. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. I'll uh, uh, unmute everyone. Um, where is it? Here it is. So go ahead if you have questions. Or type them in the chat box, of course. Okay, um, I guess I'm either doing a great job or you guys are shy, but in either okay. case, I'll, uh, I'll continue for the interest of time. Um, okay, so now I promised you that I would cover uh, variable types and some examples. So um, this is where um, your hypothesis and your design are really going to start to take shape. Um, you can have categorical, also known as nominal variables, where the levels are just basically qualitatively different uh, categories. So um, something like veteran status, is a veteran, is not a veteran. Attachment type, you know, uh, <clears throat> secure, insecure. Um, any kind of category that you can't really rank or order in any way. Um, like if you think back to something like eye color, you know, is blue greater than green or brown? No. Um, race, same thing, right? Or ethnicity. Um, okay. Now, there are other types of variables that are also categorical or nominal, but they do have an order. These are called ordinal variables. So things like socioeconomic status, right? It has to do with income. So obviously, the more you make, you're in a different category. But these now do have some kind of quantitative relationship where you have um, uh, an observable scale along which these different categories fall. Education level, same thing. Uh, and Likert type scales, excuse me, Likert type, that's, that's the um, correct way to pronounce it, is uh, uh, an example of an ordinal scale, um, depending on who you ask. That's why there's that little asterisk there. And I'll get into that in a, on the next slide, actually. Um, an interval variable is even more uh, sort of refined in terms of the scale that it's on, because uh, an interval variable is um, using data that have equal increments between categories or levels. So if you're talking about uh, education level, now if we're talking first, second, third, fourth grade, then you've got those equal uh, time intervals, right? Whereas with elementary, middle, high, and college, you don't have that same type of um, level of analysis possible. Um, and again, Likert type scales could be uh, referred to as interval scales, but um, there, there is definitely um, a debate about this uh, in the scientific community. And then finally, at the highest level of, uh, of this kind of um, uh, degree of, of uh, refinement of the quantitative variable, you have a, what's called a continuous or ratio variable. This is the same as an interval scale, but now with a meaningful zero point. Meaning that um, with, with zero, you know that there's an absence of something. So age, number of therapy sessions. Um, you start at zero and you can go up from there to some you know, pre-established upper limit, right? Um, and these types of variables uh, you can uh, uh, think of as uh, the sort of the, the, the highest end of the scale and the categorical variable you can think as the lowest end of the scale, right? Um, so let's look at something that's a really sort of uh, popular way to look at um, people's opinions, people's behaviors, which is the semantic differential. Um, and this is closely tied in with Likert type scales. Um, it basically has to do with you know, a, a range of options, strongly agree to agree uh, all the way through, strongly disagree on the other end. If you have less than five levels of uh, this kind of variable, um, you could consider that a categorical predictor outcome. Anything that is a yes or no uh, option, anything that has three response options, um, you could uh, think of as a categorical variable and conduct the statistical test that would be appropriate for that. And we'll look at specifics of that in a little bit. When you get into five or more uh, categories, now you can start to think of it as a continuous predictor or outcome. Anything less than five, you really don't want to do that. And here's, you see that this one I've uh, put together here with uh, something that's a semantic differential in terms of frequency, right? Never infrequently, sometimes, often, or always. The problem with this, this is why I have those asterisks up there, right? Um, is that what infrequently means to you 
or me might be different. So if you ask me, you know, how frequently um, do I, uh, you know, engage in a certain behavior, uh, I might say, okay, infrequently. But to me, that might mean, you know, once a day. To someone else, it might mean once a week. To somebody else, it might mean once a month. To somebody else, once a year. But they all respond the same way, right? So it's difficult to establish um, whether or not that should be called an ordinal variable, an interval variable, or a continuous or ratio variable. Um, but that boils down to how well have you asked your question. You could certainly rephrase this question to say, well, um, is it, you know, less than once a year, once a year, or once a month, once a week, once a day, more than once a day, right? And that makes it more objective, and then you can uh, really treat it more as an interval variable. Now, um, next up, we have uh, even more expanded semantic differentials, right? And this will give you uh, potentially more uh, variability in your data, which is good because then you can run correlations. The more points on a scale, the more likely it is that uh, you could conduct an actual correlation on this type of data. With three levels, two levels, anything less than five, not really an option. So um, like I mentioned, there is this problem of subjectivity, right? Um, what happens is, again, we don't know whether or not these different uh, ideas of strong disagreement or disagreement are the same in different people's minds, right? So there is a specific test that is designed to sort of handle this kind of problem. It's called the Brown-Forsyth test. And it takes the place of a, uh, a regular or a parametric um, ANOVA, analysis of variance. So you can basically treat your, uh, your outcome not as a continuous variable, but as a ordinal variable. So, so you kind of eliminate that problem of making the assumption that going from agree to strongly agree is the same as going from uh, you know, neutral to agree. We know that it's different for different people, so this brown foresight lets us account for that by basically just ranking everybody instead of assuming that there are equal um, increments between, uh, you know, a difference of going from agree to strongly agree is a difference of one, right? Going from agree to very strongly agree is a difference of two. And that's, that's parametric, right? That's a, that's a ratio type variable. The brown foresight knocks it down to an ordinal variable thereby removing uh, that uh, problem of the subjectivity. So just a little tidbit of a specific test that you can use when, when dealing with uh, semantic differential type questions. Okay, um, there's also uh, great flexibility in data no matter how you uh, uh, use them. So if you have a ratio variable, like I just sort of mentioned, you can knock it down to an interval variable, you can knock it down to an ordinal variable, even farther down to a categorical variable. Going in the other direction, however, is not possible. So let's think of a variable like age. Age is a ratio variable, right? It goes from zero to, a, I don't even know what the record is, 120 something, right? Um, you could certainly take your age variable, uh, find the person that's, you know, uh, halfway down your, dis uh, um, your distribution, so, you know, the 50th percentile. Everybody who's older than that, you categorize as old. Everybody younger than that, you categorize as young. Now you have a variable with two levels. Right? And it's, or, it's an ordinal variable because old and young fall on a, on a continuum. And you could uh, conduct a separate analysis. And you could do an analysis on age as a ratio variable, certainly, but um, you also have the option of knocking it down into a, a categorical, I'm sorry, an ordinal variable and uh, analyzing the data based on that. The pros of doing something like this is that you can maximize group differences. So for example, let's say that you find a sort of nuanced effect of age as a ratio variable. Um, and, you know, let's just say that uh, um, anxiety decreases with age, right? But it's a very subtle effect. So you see, you find a sort of negative correlation, but it's really subtle. It's not significant. Um, one thing you can do is if you really want to sort of uh, emphasize what's going on, um, even if it's for your own sort of uh, edification, is um, you could, for example, take the oldest one-fourth of your sample and the youngest one-fourth of your sample and compare them directly to each other. And this, uh, you know, this can help you sort of maximize or put into focus or stark contrast the differences between groups. Um, it also accounts for violations of statistical assumptions. A lot of the time what you'll see is if you have a continuous ratio variable, um, you'll have outliers, you'll have skew, you'll have significant um, violations of a, what's called a normality uh, assumption. You know, you're looking for that bell-shaped curve, right? And if you don't have that, um, it can often uh, be beneficial to... Uh, 
you know, split your data into groups. It's not always recommended, um, and, and here's why. You lose parametric information. So basically, um, let's say that the youngest 25% of your sample is 21 to 25, right? So four years of, of variability. And that becomes your, your group one. And then 28 to 60 is your oldest 25% of the sample, and you make that group two. Well, there might be a lot more interesting information um, within that entire spread of 21 to 60, right? So you're missing out on the nuance in favor of, um, you know, trying to, to sort of artificially inflate the, the differences that are out there. So what nuances would you be missing out on if you knocked your variable down from a ratio level down to an ordinal or categorical type of variable? And, you know, it's always going to vary case by case depending on what you're most interested in, depending on how you want to phrase your questions, and depending on um, how you're going to be uh, uh, trying to communicate the findings that you're, uh, um, that you're interested in. Okay, um, another issue to, to deal with. How are you going to design your study? Is it a between or is it a within subjects design? And um, here, this is going to be focusing on um, whether you uh, have the same participants in different groups or different participants in different groups. So between subjects design, as you uh, can already see, um, there are different participants for different levels of an independent variable, also known as a predictor. So you could be comparing young versus old, right? Can't be both at the same time. Um, violent offenders versus nonviolent offenders, you know, separate mutual exclusive groups. In a within subjects design, on the other hand, it's also called a longitudinal study. You have the same participants for different levels of an independent variable or a predictor. So here, um, the levels would be something like time and treatment, pre and post intervention status. Uh, so you have the same people going through different levels of uh, some experience, whether it's a treatment, typically a treatment, um, or you know, pre-trauma, post-trauma, what have you. There are also mixed designs, which combine a between and a within subjects design. This is where you're studying different groups at multiple time points. So you can, for example, compare pre and post intervention changes in violent and nonviolent offenders on some, some outcome variable, uh, maybe like, uh, you know, um, number of uh, violent behaviors. And um, so this is now getting into a factorial design. Um, so that's a term that um, you might have run across before as well. But anyway, those are the three sort of major uh, ways that you could uh, design a study. Um, so when it comes to actually formulating your hypothesis with all of these uh, sort of nuances in mind now, um, you can study differences between groups, right? If you have a categorical um, independent variable and a continuous dependent variable, you can certainly compare whether that categorical independent variable um, has any effect on your, your DV. So for example, is there significantly higher anxiety in males versus females? And you would use an ANOVA or a t-test to, uh, uh, to gain support for that hypothesis. There's also a, a qualitatively different type of hypothesis, which is the degree of association between two variables or, or more. Um, so you can have a continuous predictor and a continuous outcome and how strongly are they correlated, right? Um, or how well does one predict the other? You can have a categorical predictor and a categorical outcome. And that's, of course, uh, a different analysis. That would be more like a chi-square, whereas the, um, the continuous predictor and continuous outcome would be a correlation or a, or a regression. But what's interesting is that you can, um, you can ask yourself, or well, you can hypothesize, actually. Um, does one variable uh, predict the other, right? As the number of therapy sessions increases, does anxiety decrease? And that's one type of question that a correlation can certainly address. Um, but you can also make predictions based on the observed degree of association. So how much improvement can be expected for each additional session in therapy? If you have um, a measure of the number of sessions and then a measure of some outcome, uh, you know, such as, uh, you know, um, depression, then you can use linear regression to allow for predicting, you know, what is the value of each added session. Another example might be, okay, so if you know that um, somebody has a certain degree of depression, you can also predict how many sessions they would need in order to uh, improve 
by a certain amount on that same depression measure. So if you think back to high school algebra, um, this linear regression allows you to do this by basically applying the equation y equals mx plus b. So you can basically figure out the slope of um, that regression line and um, plug in a new value for a new patient and say, okay, so you scored x on this measure, so we can predict that you're going to have this much of this other measure. And then you know where to start treatment. Not necessarily you yourself, but, you know, um, other practitioners, other, um, you know, scientifically literate readers who um, would want to uh, further apply the work that you've done. So um, with that in mind, as I mentioned, there are tons of different combinations of variables, right? You'll notice here that we have on the screen um, a couple of different dimensions. First, we have predictors, right? You can have, as, as we've looked at, continuous predictors. You can have categorical predictors. Outcomes, same thing. You can have categorical outcomes. You can have continuous outcomes. Um, and not only that, there's a second layer, right? You can have multiple continuous predictors. You can have multiple categorical outcomes. You can have multiple categorical, I'm sorry, predictors, multiple ca categorical outcomes or multiple continuous outcomes. And there's a different statistical test for each one of these combinations. So before we get bogged down in this, we don't have time to go into all of these. But the point is, is that you really want to focus on what kind of analysis do you want to do? What kind of question is at the heart of your dissertation? And then the appropriate statistical tests will emerge out of what it is that you want to do. Um, and certainly uh, at NCADE, um, I can be of assistance in terms of, you know, helping you determine what's the best way to, uh, to approach the specific research uh, question that you have. Um, so here, I want to pause again. Let's see if there are any questions really quickly. I'll unmute everyone. No, thank you. No. All right. Um, so in that case, uh, let's move forward uh, and look for a minute about what happens once you have your design, you've uh, got an IRB approval, you've collected your data, and now it's time to, to analyze it. And it's very tempting to just kind of throw your data into SPSS, SPSS and um, look for that, you know, sort of holy grail of that p-value or that effect size or the, or the confidence interval. But that would be a mistake. Um, that's really the, the sort of the last step along the way. Um, the very first step in data analysis is to clean the data that you've collected. So um, when you're entering your data into whatever software you're using, um, you have to check it for integrity. Uh, what this means is that inevitably, if you're sitting there entering data for, you know, however many hours, you're going to make an error just, just by virtue of, uh, you know, motor control, right? Um, but the idea is that you always have to check your data for missing and erroneous values. If you look at your descriptive statistics and you know that you collected data on a scale from 1 to 5, and then SPSS tells you, oh, the minimum, the minimum is one, but the maximum that you have in your data is six, you automatically know that there's something wrong. You have to hunt down any kind of out-of-range values, any erroneous values. Um, if you skip some cells, SPSS will tell you how many missing values there are. And you think back to yourself, wait a minute, I didn't have any missing values. What's going on there? And so you go back in and check and make sure that your data are correctly coded. We're all human after all, right? So um, once you've done that, then you have to test statistical assumptions. And um, basically what you're looking for, depending on the type of analysis that you're going to be doing, two of the main assumptions that you have to look for are normality of distributions. Remember, we're looking for that bell-shaped curve, right? And something that's called homogeneity of variance. If you're comparing two groups, each of which has a distribution, um, if, if one is like super variable and another one is really sort of scrunched up, uh, you know, you run into problems with interpretation. So these are two major assumptions and every single one of those tests that I showed you has its own unique set. We don't have time to go into it. The take home point is that you have to make sure to address these issues. If you don't, you're going to run into problems. If you look at this graph here on the right hand side, you'll see that um, there's this blue line here, right? Um, and there's this black line here. Those are uh, lines of best fit, as they're called, and they're the basis for um, establishing uh, the relationship between variables. And you'll also notice that there's this one data point all the way out here, right? Everything else is clustered around uh, this general, you know, positive correlation here. 
But if you include an outlier, which comes from, you know, uh, a distribution that would, you know, if it has an outlier, would violate that normality dis uh, of distribution assumption, right? If you have a bell curve, you don't have many outliers. But if you have an outlier, you know, all the way over here, you violated that normality assumption. And what that outlier does is it kind of pulls that line of best fit down, right? So then you have to make a decision about what to do. Because if you trust the data without having run all these um, checks, you would just take it at face value and say, okay, this is, this is the, the pattern out in the world. But it's all based on that one outlier. So you don't want to make that mistake. Um, so you have to address these violations of assumptions. Basically, you have a few different options. You can transform your variables. What that would do is it would basically take that outlier and kind of scrunch it up closer to the rest of the data. And then you would analyze the transformed variables. Um, you can remove the outlier from the analysis, basically filter it out and, uh, and see how much the model changes. Or again, use those non-parametric tests. Remember I was talking about the Brown Forsyth? That's one example of that. Um, and again, there is a lot of different tests that you can run, right? So we don't have time to go into it, but you'll notice here, um, I don't know how legible this is on your screen, but basically um, you can see that there's a ton of different tests that we can run, right? This is just a different way of, <clears throat> excuse me, of, uh, of listing those different tests that I showed you with, you know, individual predictors, multiple predictors, individual outcomes, multiple outcomes, what type of variables are they? These are all the different tests that, uh, that you could run. This column here that I've highlighted in purple is asking, are, uh, <laughs> I can't even see it, do data meet assumptions for parametric tests? If yes, there's one type of test. If no, there's a different type of test. So again, um, you shouldn't worry too much about if your data violate these assumptions because uh, you know, statisticians have um, gone through and put together uh, solutions for these different problems. And again, uh, at NK, we can help you with uh, determining whether or not you're on the right track in your own analysis and whether the data that you're analyzing is, in fact, um, trustworthy. Okay, so um, to summarize everything, you always want to start with a testable prediction. That's your hypothesis. And you can uh, test the strength of associations between variables, or you can test the effect that one variable has on another. And that's typically, again, the, the, the categorical uh, type of variable that can uh, affect another type of variable. Um, and then, of course, you want to uh, implement the appropriate test for any combination of variables, whether you have one or multiple predictors and one or multiple outcome variables, whether they're categorical, whether they're continuous, um, that would be the, uh, uh, the sort of take-home message. And once you have your results, then you can tie it all back in with whether you support your hypothesis or not. And then you can interpret those findings. Okay, uh, so I, I want to do a shameless plug for uh, Dr. Adu's qualitative methods webinar, which is going to be happening tomorrow. So if you're listening to this presentation and saying, well, my study really seems like it should be going down the qualitative uh, side of things, um, then tomorrow there's going to be um, a webinar that will um, address uh, those kinds of um, strategies that are appropriate to qualitative studies. Uh, so that's on the 4th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, noon Central. Uh, there's the link for the GoToMeeting. Um, hold on. I'm going to uh, paste that into the chat box so that um, you can just, uh, you know, jot it down by copy-pasting it into your calendar or what have you. And um, with that, you know, I want to say uh, thank you to everyone for your attention. And again, open it up to questions. Here, um, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have the video recording available on this YouTube website. So again, I'm going to uh, paste that into the chat box. Uh, the chat box, so you can you can access it uh, even later today. So there's that. And um, of course, you can also visit NK's website. And uh, that way, uh, you can sort of familiarize yourself with all our services. Um, so I see there's a question. Um, can you talk a bit about the use of web surveys for quantitative analysis? Um, sure. Uh, that is a, uh, a very good question. Um, I see that a lot of students are using web surveys for their analyses. And um, basically, when it comes to web surveys, uh, some students will use uh, previously validated measures, 
um, other students will design their own questionnaires. And um, the, the most important thing is to pick the right tool for the job. Um, and I think that if you want to um, sort of maybe elaborate on that, um, I can give you a more specific response. So what I'll do is um, I'll just unmute you, not everyone, and maybe you want to sort of uh, provide a little bit more detail about uh, what you had in mind. So um, go ahead. Okay, so I'm basically thinking about my methodology, I'm trying to come up with, with an hypothesis, and I'm thinking mm -hmm. a little bit more about how I'm going to distribute my my survey, and uh, I'm getting a lot of uh, pushback from the department because they're thinking that web surveys may not be, um, I guess, the best teaching experience, one, and two, maybe the best appropriate or, I guess, most uh, valid uh, methodology mm -hmm. to use. Mm -hmm. there, are a lot mm -hmm. of, there are a lot of controversies with web surveys, but the sample that I'm looking at is, um, it, it would be, um, okay, so I'm doing consumer and behavior survey type thing, and I think it, it would be better for me to reach that demographic that I'm looking at uh, through the internet. So basically, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know what were your ideas about distribution techniques for some of the, I know what the sure. are, but just talk a little bit more about what some of the positive aspects of it could be. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> well, so the, the, the trade-off is that, um, you know, you send it out to the, you know, the interwebs, right? And what happens is that you're not quite sure who you're sampling, right? If you send it out to a professional network that you have, that's a different uh, uh, population than if you were to post it on, um, you know, Amazon Turk, which would be a different population um, than if you were to post on SurveyMonkey or, you know, any, any other type of outlet. If you were to post a flyer um, around campus, then obviously you're sampling a different population. So what I would uh, recommend at this point is basically determining where you're going to be sending it out. Because if you're interested in con consumer research, um, you probably want to know about consumers uh, who consume products that you're interested in, right? You don't necessarily want consumers of, um, you know, computers to be answering a survey about, uh, you know, um, I don't know, drinking containers right. because that wouldn't be an applicable population, right? So you have to think about the best uh, sort of venue in which to distribute mm -hmm. uh, uh, your survey. So um, I think I have to pose that question back to you is wh where do you think it would be an appropriate um, uh, uh, outlet? But I think uh, for, for the interest of time, I think what we should do is okay. you, you have our email on there. So um, just shoot an email over and we can set up a time to talk in more depth about, you know, the best and, and most specific ways that uh, that I could assist you with this. Okay, thank you. But yeah, it's it's a very pertinent question to a lot of students. So thank you for asking. Okay. Um, anything? Anyone else? Again, if you want to just uh, you know uh, type in a question, I can unmute you, and um, you know we can kind of continue the conversation for a few minutes more. All right. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, um, again, uh, you can again revisit the uh, uh, the recording on YouTube, and um, obviously contact us at ncade.me at the Chicago School.edu if you want to set up a time to talk in more detail about your specific analysis. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.